This is how Earl Mudd works. Earl Mudd is written in Erlang and is um, based on processes. And uh, processes are basically, along with some networking gear, they are a, a list of properties. And, some, and you'll see uh, some of the properties uh, contain the logic. So let's do, um, so everything is pretty much properties. And we'll see that we have, first of all, uh, we have values. So let's do values. And these would be things like name, age, weight, height, cost, hit points, etc. And then uh, we'll have connections to other processes. So this will be PIDs. And you'll be connected to things like your owner. You'll be connected to, um, maybe you'll be connected to your inventory items. This is from the point of view of a character. You'll, no matter what you are, you'll probably be connected to a room. And if you're a character again, you'll be connected to a body part. The final thing we have is uh, handlers. This is where the logic lives. So you might have an attack handler, the logic for how to handle attacks. You might have a look handler, how to look at things, how things look at you. You might have a move handler, how to move rooms. You might have an inventory handler, how to move from a character to a room or a room to a character. So Erlman has made up these processes that have logic handlers, they have values, and then they have PIDs that point to other processes. Next up, we have uh, the processes form a graph. So if we had a process that was a character, and again, this is the this is a process forming a graph. And then we had another process that was a room. Room. And we had another process that was a body part. Body part. And then we had another process that was a sword. Sword. And with our properties, we can have the character point to its room. So we'll do the connections in pink. So the character will have this room property. Let's give these all um, some, um, some process IDs. We'll call character one, we'll call the room two, we'll call the body part three, and we'll call the sword four. Um, normally process IDs look a little bit different, but the numbers work fine. So we'll use pink to draw out our properties. So character might have a property that says room Two, and that would connect it to this room. Then room might have a property that says character one, and that would point it back to this character. Then room would also have um, a body part, three, body part, three, and that would connect it to this body part. And then body part might have a property that's called char one, or character one, and it would point back to this character. Then this room might have a sword, actually it would be called item, four, item, and that would point to this sword, and then sword would have room one. I say might, but they all should have connections. If a sword is, if a room knows about a sword, the sword should know that um, the room owns that, that thing. Body part will consider its character its owner, and so actually it may list this as owner and character will list its room as room and sword will list its room as a room as well and then rooms typically don't have owners so that's how we graph all these processes together next I want to cover the concurrency Erlang is big on concurrency processes can run um, 
like the um, the initial object oriented ideal was to have lots of little computers and that's what these will be little computers with their own properties so an old way of um, doing a MUD might be if you had a bunch of objects you might have a class that is a manager that will first get a lock on each of these classes or on each of these objects because they all need to be static while this manager is working on it and then this, uh, this manager might need to get some data from each of these objects in order to do some calculations so we get our locks and we get our data and then finally we'd probably have some sort of result so we'll have this result broadcasted to everybody all at once while that we have the locks and then we release our locks and then we're done so in order to do this one event we had to lock up all four of these processes while we worked on it and we could and that manager could only handle that one event so let's erase this And again, this is concurrency. So now, in um, in Earl Mud, what we're going to do is we're going to have several processes. And each process can handle an event on its own at the same time. So let's say we had an event come in to this process here, and we'll call it event one. So it comes into this process, and then it, uh, when it's finished with it, it'll pass it off to this process, and then, then it'll pass it off to this process, and then it'll pass it off to this process, and then this one. And let's say these are, you know, they'll have to be connected in order to send it along the graph. So let's say they're connected like this. And let's say there's another connection um, this way. Then we get event 2 comes in at roughly the same time and let's say that one comes in here. That's 2. And it goes to this one and then it goes to this one, maybe this one, this one, and then back to this one. So you can see in some places if they arrive roughly at the same time. Here this process will have two, maybe two events in its mailbox that it'll handle and at other times they'll pass each other by. So different um, processes will be able to handle events together instead of waiting for one event to come in and be handled and then the second event come in and be handled they can come in at the same time and only the processes that need to the only processes that are dealing with it at that time are are held up all right that's concurrency now i want to go over uh networking how these are all net networked together we saw that they have properties that join each other but how do these events travel and traverse the graph All right, so let's let's build ourselves a little network. Let's say we have uh, a process here, and then one here, one here, one here, and one here. And again, we'll give these some names so we can keep track of them. So let's see. Let's do. This is process one, two, three, four five, six, seven. And let's say we have um, an event. What will, um, this is this is networking. And this is done with Earl Mud object. So a process, oh, Earl Mud object. So a process is both its properties and it's running the module Earl Mud object, which has its own state plus the properties for the process. So if we have an event that comes, uh, and let's let's join these together. Let's say that uh, these are connected, and this is connected to this one, and that one, and this is connected to to these two. Okay, so we get an event that comes in to one, and let's say let's determine uh, when when we get this event. Let's color code these so we know which ones care about this event and which ones don't. So let's say that one 
cares about the event, and five cares about the event, but four does not care about this event. Okay, so we get this event comes in. Um, Earl Mud will track several things about this event. So when it gets to one, one uh, will know what processes need to see this event. So it, it, need, it knows that processes, and I'll just say procs for now, is two, three, and four. And it knows that the ones that have seen it, since it itself has seen it, it knows the process seen it is one. And it knows that the process is subscribed, and remember red meant cares, cares about this event. It needs to, wants to know what happens with this event. So it'll, it'll subscribe, and it'll say, so subscribe is one. So processes that need to see this are two, three, four. The process that have seen it are one, and the process that are subscribed are one. So then it kicks it off to four and gives it this data. Now four says, okay, I recognize that, that and let's call it P for procs. I recognize that um, two needs to see it, three needs to see it. I am four, I don't need to see it. And now I know that five also needs to see it. And the seen ones, S, is one has seen it, this one here, and four has seen it. I've seen it. And the subs, SU, is one, and I don't care about it. Green was I don't care, so I'm going to have subs be still one. And I'm going to pass this on to five. Five is going to see it. It says, okay, I know that process is two, three, and I'm five, so I don't need to see it anymore. Need to see it, but also six and seven. And then the, sub, um, the, the ones that have seen it are one, four, and myself, I'm five, and then the subscribers is still just one, but then also I care, that's the red, so I am a subscriber as well. So that is how Earl Mud tracks, or Earl Mud object tracks um, network uh, events and then sends them through the network. So now what happens when an event gets to a process is Earl Mud object will call its handlers. So if you remember, uh, we had a um, we had a process, and part of that process was the properties that were handlers. Okay, so handlers. Uh, so the Erlmut object is going to send an event to a handler, and that. Um, uh, events in Erlang are messages. So events are Erlang messages. And events start as attempts. Um, because you, if you try to do something and you fail, that wasn't really an event. Like if you try and open a door and nothing happens, that's not really a, an open door event. If it succeeds, then it is an open door event. So events are, uh, or start as, Start as attempts. So we'll get these messages that are going through and they're considered attempts. So let's say, uh, first of all, we'll have an attempt. We'll get this message in and it'll be an attempt. There's several things that can happen to this message. We can either resend it as something else or we can say that it succeeded. That's a terrible color. Let's say we can say that it succeeded or we can say that it failed. And again, this is our event coming in. So when it gets to an attempt, these will all be in the same handler. I had them separate, but because the messages are very connected, and we'll see that in a bit, it just made sense to put them in there in the same module. So what uh, this event will come in, what it will look like is it'll be a, uh, let's do it in this color. It'll be a, an owner process. So we know who this came from. And it'll be some kind of message like A, B, C that we can pattern match on in our function clauses to decide what to do. Oh, and it'll be, sorry, the second one is props, the properties of this particular object. Remember, this is this is the object we're dealing with, and we have our values, and we have our, our, our PIDs, and these are all properties. 
So this whole thing gets sent in to the uh, to the handler that is a pro that it is itself a property of the object. So that's the message we'll get in to the attempt, and then the things we can do: we can succeed, we can resend, we can fail, or we can also modify. Um, so if we if we want to succeed, the first thing we return in our tuple, we'll do it to return tuple in a different color. The first thing we would return is um, succeed or fail. The second thing we're going to return is whether or not we want to subscribe or not. So sub, and it's a boolean, or no sub. And then the third thing we can return is um, our new properties. Now typically attempt um, handlers don't change the properties on attempt, but I suppose it's possible. New properties. The other thing we can do is if we want to change the message as it comes in, um, we don't have to always resend it to change it. If we're just adding a number to say um, the uh, decision whether or not we hit or not, like the to hit number, um, the to hit roll say, then we can just put the new message as the second parameter or the second value, second element in our in our return tuple. And if we want to resend the message, then we can send um, uh, the, the message that we send back, we do, uh, the re we return um, resend. So instead of a succeed or a fail, the first element is resend. The element or the PID that we want to resend it back to, and typically that would be our owner. Uh, no, actually, uh, it, it'll, be this, it'll be in the message itself. One of these would be like the source. So we'd say resend, PID, and then the new message that we want to resend. And then we pass back also whether or not we want to subscribe, and then whether or not, and then if we have any new properties for this object. And then once we get to our succeed, we'll be passed the properties of this process. We'll be passed the message, which is you know some kind of tuple. I can, for some reason, I can't on this draw tuples, and that's what we'll get. Um, and then we, with our, now that we know the event has succeeded, we'll have to return um, just our new properties. So if the door opened, we can change the property to open. Or if the attack succeeded, we can change, you know, change some value. And then failed, um, we'll get uh, the our properties and the result. Um, or I think it's the I think it's actually the reason why it failed, and then we'll get our um, the message that failed, and then we return the properties as well. So you um, this is when you see these different messages, you can see that the message that you get originally as the attempt is very is the same. It will be very similar to the um, event that you originally got, and so it's easy to compare the elements in those tuples if they're in the same module. So we can resend, we can um, just say yes it succeeded or it failed, whether or not we want to subscribe, we can modify the message and then keep passing it on, everybody can share information as it goes along, and then we can also fail it, and then we can also succeed it. Okay, so that covers the handlers, sort of the life cycle of the handler, how it handles an attempt and then eventually gets to a success or a failure. And so I just want to go over a resend example. If we're resending the message, we modify it and then send it back. So let's say we have some processes. Let's say we have a process here, 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 and this is resending. And then we'll say that, um, you know, let's say these are all connected. And let's say we have an event that's coming through. So let's say we get an event that comes down from some process. Um, let's label these. So this is going to be a character. This is going to be um, a room. This is going to be an exit. And we're going to need one more. Let's call this another room. We'll connect that up. This is another room. OK, let's give these. Um, this is PID1, this is PID2, this is PID3, this is PID4, 
we'll set it up with some properties. So exit has these properties. Um, it has a property uh, room east is four, and then it'll have room west is two, which is just setting up that this is east and this is west. Uh, east goes to four, west goes to two. And then if we get a message that comes in, an event, or rather an attempt, that is one move east, and it comes into the, the character, the character will say, um, well, I'm character, I'm PID1, and I know that I, this is not enough information. One moving east, we don't know what context it's in, we don't know where we're moving from, so I can add to that. So I will send this message back as one move from, and I know that I'm in room two. I'll have a property here. I know what room I'm in, so it'll be room two. So I'll send this back as one move from two to this process. This process then sends it back. So it gets back to char one move from two. And char, the character's like, okay, fine. I'm going to pass that along. One move from two. Room two sees that and says, oh, somebody's moving from me. Um, well, actually, it sees that and there's nothing you can do with it. So it just passes it along. It doesn't know what to add. But then the exit sees, oh, someone is moving from a room that I know about. They're moving from room two. Oh, and I forgot the east. Moving from two east. And it says, oh, I know that if you're going from two and you're going east, then you're going to four. So now it will send it back as one move from uh, two to four. And it doesn't need the east anymore because it knows... It knows what, what east meant. In the context of moving east from room two, it meant moving to room four. So now this, pro, this message comes back again, which is one move from two to four. And then character doesn't need to do anything with that, so it sends it on again, same thing. It sends it on to exit. Exit finally sends it on to room four. Room four doesn't need to add any data. So this is where we've resent the message. It looks like once twice, uh, yeah, once, twice, in order to get, and then this third message will be the final message. So this is resending a message. So instead of having one, uh, let me just erase this. Again, this is resending. Instead of having one manager who gathers data from each of these processes. Instead, each of these processes, as it sees a message come through, will add whatever data it needs to it, send it back, and it'll be resent, and they'll keep doing that until it has all the data that it needs. So then only one process at a time ever is adding data to that event and sending it back. And then once it sends it back, it's free. It can do other things. And until this, until this process gets it, it's free to do other things. So that is an example of resending a message to add more data to it. So the, the processes themselves are uh, communicating back and forth and collecting all the data they need to process that event. And the different handlers will know what, uh, they'll recognize intermediate messages and know what to add to them. So this is going to be a modify example. Let's do an example of modifying a message. So that was resending a message, but we can also modify a message and just send it on. So let's again do several processes. Process, 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 process. And we don't need numbers for this one, but I will label them. So let's say this is a character, and this is um, strength. This is an attribute, which is a process. Uh, this is gauntlets. They're an item. They're a process. And let's say this is um, like chest armor. And actually, let's do this in another color to reflect a different character. This is chest armor. And this will be a dexterity attribute. And this will be um, an ogre. So this is a character, and this is an ogre. And let's say the character is attacking an ogre, and we want to calculate to hit. 
So we'll start out with a value of zero for our to hit number in our message. And we'll send this message to the strength process. And the strength process knows that it gives a plus one to hit. So now, we're before, where our, our, uh, the, the important element of this message was zero for to hit, this will pass it on as plus one. And then the gauntlets will get it, and the gauntlets know that they add plus two to hit. They're magical gauntlets, or they're whatever, empowered in some way. So now our to hit number is plus three. The chest armor on the, um, on the ogre gives a negative four to hit. So it's got some armor on there. So now that takes it from, from plus three down to negative one. The dexterity further lowers this. It has a negative two, as, uh, adds, ne uh, adds two to its armor class, if you're playing a D&D style game. And now, when we get down to the ogre finally, and this will be the end of our event chain, there'll be hundreds of processes this will, that this will go through. Now we're down to negative three. The one thing to note about this is it has to be commutative operators. They either have to all be multiplication or they all have to be plus or some other commutative um, operation so that you're not doing, um, if you do, if you mix the two, uh, let's say, let's say this was, um, let's say this was times, uh, no, let's do this one. Let's say this instead of plus two, it was times two. If the event goes different routes through, you might have zero times two is zero, and then it's you know then maybe it comes down here and it's plus one, so now it's one. Whereas if it goes this way, it's plus one, and it goes up now it's times two, now it's two. So instead of being plus one, this if it goes this way, it's plus one. If it goes this this way, it's plus two. So they have to be commutative because uh, the key here is that processes never. Uh, unless they resend, they never communicate backwards up the chain. So if you go through these processes, you know this way, you're never gonna you're never gonna go back to a previous process. So a process, a new process, can't have anything that a that a previous process would have needed to know about. So in this case, when I'm doing calculating to hit, I make it I, I program it so that the character once it adds, or let's say rather the once the strength adds plus one to hit, it never needs to know what the what the to hit value is until it succeeds. So once we get a success message back to all of these, then it'll have the final to hit number and then those processes will know about it. So that is an example of where instead of resending an event, we just modify the event. And the last thing finally is um, time to live. I don't want, um, if I have a lot of processes, let's say, let's say we have some rooms. Uh, this is uh, time to live. Let's say we have a room here, and a room here, and a room here, and we'll have some exits, and we'll just do them smaller. They're, they're all processes, and they're connected. Those are, those are processes that are, uh, you know, there's only, there's only a few of them. But then if we get into characters, um, typically a character will be a tree of processes. So let's say if you have, you know, skills, and we'll have some, you know, body parts, and each of those body parts will have items. And each of those items will have, you know, maybe have a spell or some other process on them or attributes. We're gonna have this huge tree of processes. And so that's for each character. This is a character. So if we have 10 characters in a room and we also have some other processes, we have a couple of trees for some reason, we have a rock, we have, you know, um, maybe, you know, we have some weather. This is going to be a lot of processes per room. And if we're going to have to take our events and we're going to have to run them through each and every process, it's going to take a while. And I don't want to do that for the entire MUD. So I made it so that when an event goes, um, as soon as an event gets to a room, that event now has that, that room tied to it. And as soon as it, if it goes to a, a, an, an exit, and again, Let's just label these. This is an exit, exit, and this is a room, room, room. When it gets to the exit, the exit can see that it has a room, and that room is attached to itself. It says, "Oh yeah, I know about this." You know, it'll, let's say, um, let's say that's room um, one. It says, "Oh yeah, I know, I know about this is room one here. This is room two. This is room three. It's like, oh yeah, I know about room one. And then it gets over to this room. 
So now we can, with the, this um, event, if it's, say, like opening a door or casting a spell or attacking something or picking something up, can be seen by everybody in this room and the next room. So all the characters in this room would get it, all the trees, rocks, weather, and then it go to this room. Then when it gets to this exit, this exit says, I don't know about R1. I know about R2 and R3, so I'm not going to pass this along. So this will be our sort of time to live. It'll go into everything in this room that it that's there and it'll go to everything in every connecting room. So if we had two other rooms that were connected, then that exit would, once it's done here, would, this process would send it to this room and it would send it to this room and all, the, and all the stuff in that room and all the stuff in this room. So there's thousands of processes that will see this event, but at least it won't go through the whole mud and potentially see millions of events. So that is time to live. So now we've seen in Earl mud, We've seen that it is a um, it is a, gr a graph of processes. Each process has uh, handlers, and it has uh, PIDs, which form a graph, and it has values, and then. Uh, to navigate the graph, we have um, Earl Mud object, and then Earl Mud object will send these events to these various handlers, and the handlers will be able to either resend the event, modify the event, or simply succeed or fail the event, as well as subscribing to the event in case they want to get notified when it succeeds or fails. And the major reasons for doing this are for not currency, but rather concurrency. And just uh, as a note, this is experimental. I've got some unit tests working, um, but I never built a mud this way, and I don't have, um, I don't know if it'll work. Obviously, we're going to have some uh, there's no transactions, so there may be cases where, because of events flying around um, all at the same time, you may be, uh, you know, the classic example is maybe you emptied your bank account and then you make a withdrawal, and because at the time of withdrawal, your bank account hadn't been updated, you're able to withdraw twice, but with how fast these attempts will go through the mud and how fast um, Erlang processes messages, I think it'll be rare that you run into that kind of case. Uh, it'll take microseconds to process each event. So you'd have to be hammering on the keyboard pretty quickly to figure out a way to break it. I mean, somebody will figure out a way to break it, but I think it'll work out okay, and we'll see. So that's how Earl Mud works.